If you have your Bibles this morning, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. We're going to wrap up our study of the armor of God this morning, but we're not going to wrap up this book. We've got one more section before we finish it and move into the book of Philippians. I would encourage you, if you have never or haven't in a while, start reading the book of Philippians. Get ready, prepare yourself for us to move verse by verse into that book. I'm excited. It's one of my favorite Bible books. I've got 66 of them. <laughs> We've looked at the armor of God. Paul says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Then he says that we are to put on the armor of God, and he described each of the six pieces. Three of them, he said, having, with the idea of having that on. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. And then he shifted to taking. So it's something that we take with us, not necessarily always on, but we have it at hand in the evil day. And he says that we're to take the shield of faith, wherewith you may quench all of the fiery darts of the evil one. And he said, in taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And the sword of the Spirit was the only offensive piece of armor that we looked at. But it's not technically the only offensive weapon that we have. It's the only weapon that we hold ourselves, the sword of the Spirit, but, but there's another weapon that we have access to. And I'm afraid this morning that the church in general is falling way short in utilizing this amazing weapon. Now, I've never been in the military. I know people who have. I know people who have been in combat. And communication is vital on the battlefield. As we've studied this, Paul has told us that we're behind enemy lines. We're behind enemy lines. We're in the thick of it. We are in the battle. We're in spiritual warfare. The problem with you and I is, is all we can see is what's around us. We can't see over the next hill. We can't see in the next valley. We, we don't know what's happening beyond our capacity to see. And so the greatest weapon that we have is the ability to call in an airstrike on our enemy. That's, that's our greatest weapon. To be able to have air support. To be able to communi communicate with command who has all of the technology that we don't have in the midst of the battle. They can, they can see by satellite where the enemy is and where the enemy's moving and, and where the enemy is holding up and, and, and all of the rest. And if the soldier is not in communication with that, well, it's going to be more difficult to live a life of victory. And it's my earnest prayer this morning that by the time we leave today, that you and I will recommit to this wonderful blessing that we have called prayer. Prayer. I'm convinced it's the only way that we stay strong as soldiers, and it's the only way we overcome the enemy. We often think that, okay, well, we need to pray so that we can, we can minister. I, I think we miss it when we think that way because prayer 
is the ministry. Prayer is the ministry. And Jesus said, my father's house should be called a house of worship. Oh, no, 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 no that's not what he said. Uh, Jesus said, my father's house shall be called a house of teaching. He said, my father's house will be called a house of prayer. And did you know that the disciples never came to Jesus and said, Jesus, will you teach us how to teach like you do? We have no record of that. The disciples never came to Jesus and said, Jesus, will you teach us to do miracles like you do? Show us how to wave our, our spiritual wand, Lord. No, but the Bible does tell us that Jesus was asked by the disciples, Lord, will you teach us to pray? They overheard his prayer. Could you imagine? I, I like to eavesdrop in church. Sorry if that makes you feel uncomfortable, but, but I love to hear people pray. Now, in some circles, people all pray at the same time. Here at the porch, we're really not that much into that. We, we like to give each person the opportunity to pray while everyone else, not that God gets confused when everybody's praying at the same time. He's more than capable of, capable of doing that. But, but we benefit from hearing those prayers. And I love to just listen. And there was an occasion where Jesus was praying and the disciples were just kind of listening. The people said that never a man spake like this man spake. They said that they were astonished at his doctrine, for he, 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 taught one with author, he taught with authority, not as the scribes, which said, well, Rabbi so-and-so says, and Rabbi so-and-so says. He come along and said, you have heard that it hath been said of them of old time, but I say unto you. They're like, this guy acts like he wrote the book. But they overheard him praying, and they were so moved, they said, Lord... Would you teach us how to pray? Now, there's, there's kind of this idea in the church that prayer is something that you pull out of the toolbox when every other tool didn't work. We kind of have that idea, oh my, has it come to that? Right, you get the text, please pray for granny, right? It's critical. Oh no, has it come to that? And the truth is, is we should have been praying for granny all along. Look at verse 18. Paul says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. All means all and that's all all means and I am included in the all so please pray for me. Please pray for me. Do you know that's the greatest thing you can do for another human being? Is pray for them. He says, and for me that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. Christians who complain about their pastor's teaching or preaching that are not also praying for him should hush. Now, if you've been praying for your pastor weekly, then go ahead, complain. It's not going to do any good, but, but pray harder. It'd be better if you prayed harder than, than complain. But, but Paul, listen, let me remind you that Paul is writing this letter from prison. Now, I'm getting to the end of my letter, and I'm saying, please pray that I get out of here quick. But that's not what Paul says. I'd be praying, please, please uh, deposit some money in my, my commissary fund because I'm out of snacks and I need some toothpaste and my toothbrush is, is looking bad. I mean, it's not good in here. Help a brother out. Paul says, what I want you guys to pray for me while I'm in this prison is that I would have utterance and that I would have boldness, courage to speak the gospel clearly 
Because more than anything, that's what these people need to hear. More than I need to get out of here. See, Paul understood something that I think sometimes I forget, maybe you forget too. Wherever you're at right now, whatever you're going through, if you're a child of God, it's part of God's plan. And we need to figure out, well, why are we there? Not, why is this happening, right? But more the idea of, what do you want me to learn? What do you want me to do, right? What are you trying to do in me or to someone else through me? He says, I want you to pray for me. Look at verse 20. He says, for I am an ambassador in bonds. Now, I, I don't know about you, but once again, right? My ambassadorship would be put on hold. Right? And until I got out. I, I would be focused on my parole hearings. But Paul says, I represent Jesus in this jail. And you and I struggle to represent him in the office and in the neighborhood and what other circles we might find ourselves in. Paul says, I represent Jesus here. So I'm asking you to pray, not that I get out of here, not that I get anything. But I'm asking that you pray for me so that as long as I'm in here, I'm accomplishing what God has for me to accomplish. Wow. This causes me to want to revamp my prayer requests. <laughs> How about you? Does it kind of make you, you know, feel a little like, hmm, maybe? <laughs> no. no. I, I want to talk about prayer this morning. First, we see here in this verse, verse 18, prayer's palette. Prayer's palette. What I mean by that is, is, is an artist has a palette, and, and on that palette, there's, there's all these different colors. And, and the artist will mix the colors together to make hues and, and tints and shades. It's, it's a very diverse type of thing. And we need to understand that that's what prayer is. We, we often think of prayer as just this singular thing, you know. God is great, God is good, let us thank you for our food, in Jesus' name, amen. But it's so much richer than that. Or, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. It's so much richer than that. Because Paul says here, praying always with all prayer. There's all kinds of prayers. There's a prayer of confession where I confess to the Lord what I've done. Lord, I, I ask you to forgive me for the two chickens I stole last night and the chicken that I stole the night before and you can go ahead and forgive me for the three chickens I'm going to steal tomorrow night. No, no, that's not how, that's not how confession works, right? But, but, but we're to confess before the Lord. Confession restores fellowship. Because the Bible teaches that our, our sins kind of put distance between us and the Lord. And so a prayer of confession, the Bible talks about a prayer of faith. The Bible talks about a prayer of agreement, where you, you pray one with another. Jesus says, if, if, if two of you agree upon anything on the earth, it shall be done. There's a prayer of intercession. It's a prayer of supplication. There's all these different types of prayer. It's a diverse activity. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, we're told, Be careful for nothing, but in everything pray. Don't answer out loud, but have you ever prayed about brushing your teeth? Have you ever prayed about taking the trash out? Have you pray about everything? 
Imagine what would happen in my life if I prayed and communed with the Lord about everything. If I took that palette and all of those hues and tints, what beautiful thing God might display. As all of those hues are mixed together and colors that, that I haven't even dreamed of would come into view in my life. If I would simply learn to pray about everything, praying all prayers, prayer of worship, prayer of thanksgiving, praise is prayer. All of these are prayers, imprecatory prayers, which Jesus took us deeper in that vein. The psalmist would pray, Lord, bust their teeth down their throat. And sometimes I've felt that way. And, and, and I've prayed like that sometimes. And, and I'm not saying that God's answering that prayer. He's, he's gracious. He's all wise and all knowing. But, but he knows my heart. But Jesus says, Gordon, a better prayer would be, Lord, bless them. Because he taught that we should pray for even our enemies. Ooh. Those people on the other side of the political aisle that you're typically blasting on social media. Bless them. Love them. What would happen? Both sides are like, if they're in power, they're going to tear the world apart. Pray for them. I never thought about that. Pray for them. Why not pray about everything? Imagine what would happen if I stopped complaining totally. And instead of complaining, I prayed. What would happen if I stopped judging you altogether? And instead of doing so, I prayed for you. While the other per people in the group would say, did you see what she wore? Oh my goodness, I can't believe that. While they're doing that, I'm like, Lord, I ask you to bless Sister Spookenbacher. I, I, I'm not a, I'm not a clothesline policeman, Lord. That's between you and her. I don't even care what she's got on, but I ask that you would bless her heart. I ask, Lord, that you would touch her life, that you would draw her closer to yourself. Because if Sister Spukenbacher's wearing a skirt that's too short, Jesus can change that. All you're going to do is offend her and run her away. Prayer is this beautiful palette. And, and I'm encouraging you to explore all the colors on the wheel. It's easy to kind of just get stuck in my little bitty routine prayers, my little repetitious prayers. It's time to broaden our horizon. Secondly, I want to remind you of prayer's pattern. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus says, this is the way you ought to pray, our Father which art in heaven. Now, when we're thinking of spiritual warfare, this is, this is very encouraging, right? Because in, in warfare, you want the, the, the high vantage point. And when I'm reminded that my Father is in heaven, I'm reminded that there is none higher than Him. So my enemy might be higher than me, but I've got an overwatch, I've got an overwatch that's, that's watching over me that's higher than my enemy. And so that pattern reminds me, you're in heaven. There's none higher. There's none greater than you. And then he says, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed or holy is your name. See, it's important for me to recognize in the heat of the battle that God is holy. Because the Bible teaches that God cannot be tempted. So while I'm fighting for my life, guess who is not? God is not, right? There's no temptation taking you but such as is common to man, right? We're, we're all in the thick of it. We're all in the midst of it. But there's one who is not. He's there present, but he's not in it like we're in it. He's holy. The enemy can't touch him. As a matter of fact, when Jesus was here, the Bible says... He was tempted at all points just like as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, the writer of Hebrews says that he is able to help those who are being tempted. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come. Right? When, when the enemy's coming in, the enemy's advancing, my prayer, our prayer is, your kingdom come. Your will be done. How many of you know that it's not God's will that the enemy beat you? That's not his plan. That might be what the enemy's trying to tell you. The enemy might be telling you this morning, you're never going to win. You're never going to get ahead. This is never going to change in your life. You've been struggling with this. Look how long. Don't get your hopes up. You're just setting yourself up for disappointment. No. God's will. All the time that Job was in the midst of of turmoil, wondering where God had gone, he was right there. Right there. And he was, he was creating something greater than we could ever imagine. Because Job was thinking about what he lost, wishing that he was never born, cursing the day of his birth. And then later on he says, Oh, I have heard of you with my ears, but now I have seen you with my eyes. You ever heard of foxhole religion? When the bullets get flying and life gets real, God has a way of shaking off all the nonsense in our lives, right? Your will be done. Your will be done. And then he moves into some petition. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then, then, right, this is, this is where command is so important. Lead us not into temptation, right? I don't know where the enemy's gonna show up next, right? And I, my head's on a swivel, but, but there's a lot I can't see, right? Goodness and mercy's following me. God goes before me, right? He's a shield around me. And then he says, deliver me from evil. Right there in that pattern of prayer. I want to encourage you, I want to encourage myself to start praying this pattern. Asking God to lead you, to deliver you beforehand. And not just, he's hot on my heels, Lord. Help, he's hot on my heels. Because if I were in communication with command... Maybe the, the Lord would say, just, just around this bin, you're going to encounter the enemy. Get ready. Wouldn't that be nice? Instead of walking around the corner and poof, getting clotheslined, poof, where'd that come from? <laughs> Command knew. God knows. God sees. So that pattern is something we need to remember. We also need to remember prayer's priority. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, Paul says, first of all, right? Let's, let's, let's don't just paraphrase it. Let me, let me read it to you so we don't get it. Turn with me to 1 Timothy chapter 2. He says, I exhort, therefore, that first of all, supplications prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. I exhort, first of all, prayer. 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 Pray before you get out of bed. Let prayer be the last thing you do before you go to sleep. I want to start a movement. Let's, let's start saying grace again. Instead of just sitting down like a pig and burying our snout in the trough. Acknowledging where this came from. Who provided this? Novel idea. Pray before you leave. Pray for your spouse before your spouse goes off to work. Pray for your children before they go off to school. Pray for your children when they come in from school. Pray for, for your spouse when they come in from work. And then leave them alone for a little bit, maybe. And, you know, and, but, but I exhort, therefore, first of all, prayer. Prayer, 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 prayer. We should be praying, praying, praying. It's a priority. Prayer is a priority for us. 
Some of you are thinking, I already know that. Now do it. It's good that we know it. But we need to do it. And so I challenge you. If, if, you're, if you're old enough to get it, I double dog dare you. Some of you are like, what did he just say? I challenge you. Start praying about everything. When we get to the end of this service, and the pastor's praying, maybe that'd be a good time for you to be praying, Lord, I ask that whatever you wanted me to really get from that message would sink into my heart. And, and as we close out with this last song, I pray, Lord, that you'd help me not to be thinking about where we're going to go eat. Because you've never caused me to go hungry, and you never will. You promised that in your word. So, Lord, I, I, I just want to be sure to give you just a little bit more time to, to wrap up, finish whatever it is that you want to do in my life today. Because I know this, this moment is never going to happen again. And so I don't want to miss what you're doing. And while I'm praying, Lord, I pray for the person standing next to me or that person that I brought with me or the person that I came with or, or whatever. I exhort, therefore, first of all, prayer. It's a priority. We should be praying, 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 praying. And when you've prayed all you know to pray, pray some more. Pray some more. Then there's prayers per perpetuation. It's, it's, it's to continue. It's to never, ever, ever, ever stop. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, 18. 17? Help me out, scholars. 17 or 18? Pray without ceasing. Who? Huh? Somebody over here? 17? Don't be, if you know it, say it. Don't be shy. I need help. All right. You're not getting, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That one makes a lot of believers feel guilty. Have you ever heard that verse and thought, oh man, anybody? I'm going to have a little bit of honesty in here this morning. I'm praying for the rest of you. I'm just kidding, just kidding. Pray without ceasing because oftentimes we think, well, how, how in the world is that even possible? How do you pray without ceasing? How many of you have ever built a fire? Most of, wow, if you have not raised your hand, I, we need to set a time and I want to go out into the woods with you. To, I just want to, we just build a fire. We just sit around the fire and just talk. When you build a fire, right, once you get it going, you don't, you don't keep building it constantly. Periodically, you just kind of feed the fire. You just kind of stoke the embers. You, every now and then, you lay another log, another piece of wood on it to keep it going. That's the way pray without ceasing is. That's the idea. I'm not... 24-7 constantly saying something with my vocal cords to the Lord. But I'm keeping that fire going. I never hang up. I would encourage you, start the dialogue if you haven't right now and never hang up again. You just never hang up again. You see people in the grocery store, it's so funny, I see people in the grocery store and they get, they get, they get it on speaker. And they're going down with their buggy. And you hear the other person like, rah, 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 talking on them. And they're just, yep, that's right, uh-huh. Everybody in the world's hearing it, right? And you're thinking, what are you doing? Well, what they're doing is, is they're having a conversation with the person on the other end of that line. And you might be thinking, like I've thought at times, well, won't you hang up and call them when you get done grocery shopping? But that's the idea of pray without ceasing. It doesn't matter if I'm buying groceries I'm fixing the car, pumping gas, going to school, on my way to work, doing my job. I never hang up. It's a perpetual conversation. Colossians 4.2 says, continue in prayer. Just continue, continue, continue. Imagine what would happen in my life if I never hung up on God again. Bless you. 
What would life be like if in the next crisis that I face, I didn't have to go, come on, come on, come on. I'm being funny. We know that that really doesn't happen with the Lord. But, but if I didn't have to, it'd be just, you know, I'm just doing my thing. Hey, you still, yep, I'm still there, Gordon. I'm still there. Whoo, I need you right now. I got you. I got, I'm with you. I'm with you. Imagine what life would be like if it was that type of dialogue. And that's what I believe this, this perpetual praying looks like. I'm driving down the road. Some idiot on the phone. You know, it's one of those moments. And the very next thing, instead of cussing them, thank you, Lord. Whew. You give your angels charge over me. Thank you for all the times. I get out in the midst of all these crazy people who forget that they're driving, they're using their phones, and you bring me home day after day safely. You've been doing that for, for 52 years in my life. I just praise you right now. Just this perpetual conversation that's happening. And then prayers, persistence. Persistence. And that's a little bit different, right, than it, than it continuing to happen. Sometimes you got to dig deep. How many of you sometimes don't feel like praying? If you didn't raise your hand, please get with me after the service because you have learned something that I want to learn. I really do. I want to learn it. Turn with me, if you will, to Luke chapter 18. Jesus talks about this idea of persistence, and especially in times of battle, because sometimes you can become battle-weary. Maybe some of you are that way this morning, where it's just like, when is the fight ever going to go end? And Jesus tells us something interesting about prayer. When you feel like giving up, when you feel like quitting, the temptation is to stop Bible study, stop quiet time, stop coming to church, and stop praying. Let me remind you this morning, that's when you need those things the most. Look what Jesus says. It says in verse 1, And he spake a parable unto them to this end, that men ought always to pray and not faint. Not faint. Remember Peter? I'll never deny you. I got this. I know, Peter, you got it. You're going to crash and burn. No, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. I'm ready to go to prison. I'm ready to go to the grave. Okay? I'm glad to hear that, Peter. Are you ready to go to prayer meeting? <laughs> Peter? Peter? <laughs> Peter? Pe All right, forget it, Peter. <laughs> that may not always pray and not faint. I'm convinced that the times in my life where I wanted to quit was a direct result of a lack of prayer. Because prayer is what keeps me from quitting. It's what keeps me from fainting. You, you ever seen those fainting goats? Those videos? <gasps> bonk. You know, I, I, I do that so much in my life. <gasps> you know, bonk. Get all stiff, bonk. If I would pray, I wouldn't be so... <sighs> I'd be relaxed, I'd be calm. I'd be in touch with command. I would know that overwatch was in place. This is the parable. He said, There was in a city a judge which feared not God, neither regarded man. There was a widow in that city, and she came unto him, saying, Avenge me of mine adversary. And he would not for a while, but afterward he said within himself, Though I fear not God, nor regard man, yet because this widow troubleth me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge saith. And shall not God avenge his own elect, which cried day and night unto him, though he bear long with him? 
if this judge finally does something because this little widow just keeps pestering him, shall not God avenge you? I tell you, verse 8, he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth? Prayer. Prayer is that thing that keeps me from quitting. It keeps us from fainting. It's that secret ingredient that keeps us in the battle longer. Hmm. Let's talk about prayer's power. James 5.16 says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That effectual fervent is a phrase in the Greek. And the Greek word is, well, it's a phrase in the English, it's a word in the Greek, and it's energio. It's where we get our English word energy. Energy. The energetic prayer of a righteous man availeth much. There's power in prayer. There's power in prayer. We need to recognize that power. So your spouse is not what you wish your spouse to be. So what you do is, is you nag them. Yeah, and, and if you nag a little bit longer, then, then they're going to get it eventually, right? If you nag long enough, they're going to get it. If you say it again, no. Why don't you pray? Why don't you pray? Maybe your children aren't living out your faith like you wish that they would at this time. You can remind them of how terrible they are and shouldn't be doing that and Stop that. And you're so disappointing. Why don't you just pray? Have we forgotten the power of prayer? The power of prayer. There's an Old Testament example. Abraham sitting in his tent, and it's, it's the hot part of the day, and God shows up with two angels, has a conversation with him, and they're about to walk off, and God stops in his tracks. And he says to himself, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? No, I'm going to tell him. He turns around and he says, Abraham, the cry of Sodom has come up before me. And I'm going to go down there and I'm going to see if it's what I have heard it to be. And if it is, I'm a clean house. Abraham immediately thought about his nephew Lot. And he says, Lord, what... What if there's 50 righteous? Surely the God of all the universe is going to do right. You're not going to destroy the whole city for 50. And, and you guys know the, the, the prayer. He goes down 50, 45, 40. He just keeps going all the way down to 10. And at that point, Abraham's like, surely there's at least 10 of them by now, right? I got them covered. God had those angels physically, listen, physically move. Lot and his family from there. The power of prayer. Herod took the life of James and he saw that the people were happy about it in the book of Acts. And so he scooped up Peter, threw Peter in prison and he was going to wait until after the holidays and he was going to give the people more of what they wanted. But the Bible says prayer was made at John Mark's mother's house. Now, Herod has decided what he's going to do. How are you going to stop that? Well, I didn't vote for him. So it's those Christians that voted for him. It's their fault that Peter's in prison. It doesn't matter who voted for Herod. There's power in prayer. God can still stop him. And he does. God sends an angel there. 
delivers Peter out of the prison, Peter finally kind of comes to himself and realizes, man, this ain't a dream. I'm out. God paroled me. He shows up to the prayer meeting. Isn't that something? The person you're praying for shows up at the prayer meeting. One of the ladies in the group, who is it? It's Peter. What? It's Peter. And she runs back in there, busts up the prayer meeting. Peter's at the front door. They're like, no, he's not. We're praying for him in prison. You see, we're in good company because they forgot the power of prayer. It's human. It's, it's, it's natural for us at times to do that. We need to be reminded of that. They said, you're crazy. It's got to be his angel. It was easier for them to believe that it was Peter's angel knocking on the door than that God had delivered Peter out of prison. Jesus looked at Peter one day and he said this, Peter, Satan has desired to have you. Could you, could, you, could you imagine? Could you imagine Jesus showing up this morning, walking up to you? He walks up to me and he says, Gordon, Satan wants you. Huh? And then he says, he wants to sift you as wheat. Wow. But I've prayed for you. I've prayed for you. Moms, dads, spouses, friends, let me remind you this morning the power of prayer. Yeah, you're holding your ground. You're standing your ground. You're wearing your armor. You're doing everything you can to be strong. You've got the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. But don't forget, you can call in an airstrike. Right? You've got command at hand waiting for you. One last one. Prayers, parakletos. Prayers, parakletos. How many of you have had a prayer partner? How many of you have a prayer partner? Somebody that it's like you exchange prayer requests and you pray for each other. And I want to remind you this morning of a prayer partner that I believe is overlooked far too often. And that is the Holy Spirit. Because in Romans chapter 8, we're told this, when we don't know how or what to pray, I'm that way a lot, right? I know things about people in this congregation and it's like, I, I mean... I know that it's broke. I don't know why it's broke. I don't know what broke it. I don't know who's at fault. I'm really not sure what the, the prescription is. I, I, I know I should pray for this person, but I really don't, I, I, I don't even know how to pray. There have been times when, when I've been called on to pray for people who are terminally ill. And you're like, I, what, 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 I don't know what to pray. I mean, obviously, I want God to heal them and raise them up, but is it God's will? I mean, he doesn't, ultimately, we're all going to be healed when we get to heaven, but, but, but he doesn't heal everybody. It's like, I, but the Holy Spirit, Paul says, intercedes with groanings which can't be uttered. There, there, there's, there's this groaning on the inside when you just don't even know what to pray. There is one interceding with you. That in and of itself should encourage all of us to want to pray more. Now think about this. When I go to pray, my prayer partner is always there. There has never been a prayer that I've prayed that he wasn't present. Now, a lot of prayers I prayed that I didn't acknowledge that he was there. Didn't even think about him. Didn't rely on him at all. How many of you know people that, bear with me here, that seem to, to pray better than you pray? 
do you know people? I know people like it's like, man, I love when you hear them pray, it's like the ground moves. It's like, it's like heaven just kind of come. It's like, how does he, how does she? It's like somehow they got a they got a direct line, right? Woo, did you feel that? Yeah, you know, it's it's that kind of thing. I know people like that. I love when those people pray for me. It's just like, oh yeah, yep, yep, don't just you keep going. The reality is we have someone like that with us all the time. And Paul goes on to say in the next verse that, that he knows what is the mind of the Spirit. He, he searches, he says in Corinthians, the deep things of God. He intercedes for the... Let me, let me read this. This is going to be the last verse that I want to read to you this morning. But in Romans 8... Yes. Likewise, I love being in the midst of scholars. You guys encourage me to know my Bible more. Romans 8, 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for us. He maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Wow, imagine every prayer being the will of God. That'd give you some confidence, wouldn't it? There's a lot of times where I'm like... I, I, Lord, do I ask for healing? Do I ask for comfort? Do, do, do I ask you to deliver this person from this problem? Or do I ask you that they learn what it is that you're trying to teach them? Is this an attack of the enemy? Or, or is this chastisement from you? I don't, I, I don't know. But I got a prayer partner that knows. And so I need to learn how to rely upon him. Now, the only way I know to do that is, is you have to slow down a little bit. I know I just made you mad when I said that, right? We, we've got to learn to slow down. You, 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 can, you can stop swiping a little bit. Scrolling, yeah, swipe. Just, just, Lord, when's the last time you just said, you know what, shh, 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 shh. Be still. Lord, this is the end of the service, and I, I don't know who's listening or, or what you're doing. I, I don't know who's a believer in here, who's not. I don't know who's drifted and who you're wanting to call home. I, I need you to help me. We need to learn this. This is what we need to learn to do in prayer. Prayer's not a little, you know, we were joking during band practice. Somebody said something. We weren't listening. Everything was going on. and It sounded like you were at the drive through at Taco Bell. Can I take your order, please? Sometimes it's kind of, you just got to, okay, stop, stop. Lord. Because life can get that way. And the crazy thing is, is we get used to that. And then life crashes. And then we want to panic. And that's not the cycle that God wants for you and for me. He doesn't want us living this yo-yo up, down, up, down, up, down, close, far, close, far. That's, that's not his plan. And the enemy's at work. He's, he's in the middle of all that trying to do all of these things. And you swing that sword, you can hold that shield, you can stand your ground. But don't forget... You can pray. You can pray. So let's do that. Let's stand.